excited to stand before you on today. And I think one of the most beautiful things about resurrection is it just truly reminds us how much of a boss our God is. Like our God is so boss where he gave darkness a curfew. <laughs> you have 72 hours, boo-boo, to do what you're going to do. But after the 72 hours is over, no man takes my life, I lay it down. And if I lay my life down, I'm going to pick it back up again. Jesus hit hell with the hardest curve of all time by telling hell you thought. <laughs> That's a prophetic word for somebody you thought. You thought that that divorce would take me out. You thought. You thought that that trial would take me out. You thought. You thought that it was over, but I am still here remaining in the land of the living. Can I get everybody in the house to make some noise for everybody watching online all over the world? Thank you so much for joining us. Happy resurrection to you. And we're honored that you chose us. Now, I need to make sure, did everybody get their certificate of custody? Everybody, okay? Everybody watching online, what you can do is there is a QR code in the lower third. You can take a picture of it, and it'll take you to a link. Or you can go to redefinetv.net and click on resources, and you will be able to download it for yourself. Even though it's virtual, I want it to feel personal so that you can have this certificate. You can laminate it. You can put it in a frame. You can put it on your wall. And throughout our shamanic journey, I'm going to explain why I wanted to make sure that everybody had a certificate of custody. So there are three foundational texts, three foundational texts. I could not compact and compartmentalize this teaching presentation to one passage of scripture. There are three foundational scriptures. If you do not have a certificate of custody, we have our ushers walking down the aisle to make sure that everybody has one. Three foundational texts that we're gonna go to. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. And then we're going to head over to Luke chapter 10, starting our reading at verse 25, and then Matthew 28, verse 16 and onward. One more time, Mark chapter 12, verse 28, Luke chapter 10, verse 25, and then we're going to conclude our foundational reading at Matthew chapter 28, starting at verse 16. If you're ready, can I get you to shout in the building, I'm ready. Mark chapter 12, verse 28 declares, One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. In other words, Jesus is saying, we want full custody. Then our second foundational reading, a little similar to the text, but different in its own way. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, it says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus replied, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. I want to pause right here in our foundational reading so that I can emphasize two components of our foundational text. There are two sections that I want to bring to your attention for your consideration on this Resurrection Sunday morning, and that is the latter part of verse 26 in Luke chapter 10, when Jesus says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? In other words, Jesus is saying, how do you interpret it? Jesus is really revealing to us the power and the necessity of holistic, 
accurate exegesis of scripture. That means our ability to interpret it right. Because watch this. It is not God's word if it is not interpreted right. God is obligated to sponsor and endorse his word. But he is not obligated to sponsor and endorse our word that we claim are his. I need to say that one more time for anybody who's going to profile later. God is obligated to sponsor and endorse his word. But he is not obligated to sponsor and endorse our words that we claim are his. Like, he watches over his word to perform it. His word will not return unto him void. But our words that we claim are his will be voided every time. He watches over his word to perform it. That's Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 12. The word perform in Hebrew is twofold. It means to protect or to have surveillance. So instead of he watches over his word, exchange the word watches with, with protects. I will protect my word to ensure I perform it. The word I spoke over your life, I'm going to protect it. The word I spoke over your children, I'm going to protect it. The word I spoke over your mind, I'm going to protect it. And there's no devil, there's no demon, there's no diabolical agency, there is no trial, there is no failure, there is no mistake that's going to stop me from performing my word. I got surveillance on it. I'm watching it every hour. I'm watching it every minute. I'm watching it every day. I have surveillance on my word. But I'm not obligated to have surveillance on your word. (laughs) Hear me, y'all. The power of scripture is married to the interpretation being accurate. Did y'all hear what I just said? The power of scripture is married to the interpretation being accurate. This is why bad doctrine is so venomous. This is why bad teaching and bad preaching is so venomous because if I was a note taker, I would write this down. Bad doctrine is a perversion of hope. Talk Holy Spirit. Bad doctrine is a perversion of hope. It causes for people to hope for God to do what he never said he would. And I wonder how many people are disenchanted with church, disenchanted with the gospel, and disenchanted with Jesus due to bad doctrine. They have had hope, and they have trusted God to do something that his word never said he will do. That's just one section that I want to bring to your attention. The second section in our foundational reading is verse 28 of Luke chapter 10, where Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Do what? Love the Lord your God with all of your strength, with all of your mind, with all of your soul. Do this and you will live. In other words, you want peace? I got to have custody. One person caught it. You want joy? I got to have custody. You want fulfillment? I got to have custody. You want understanding and wisdom? I have to have custody. I have come so that you might have life. And life more abundantly. Watch me, church. But you don't get the abundantly without me having full custody. Talk Holy Spirit. You don't get the abundantly without rendering me your custody. And our last foundational reading that we're going to park on for the remainder of the time that we have together. Matthew 28, verse 16. This is after Jesus rose from the grave. Then the 11 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. That's what we did on Friday, on Good Friday. And he says, okay, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I want you to know 
that I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus says, okay, I defeated death. Oh, death, where's your sting? Death thought he had me, but I defeated it. And now all authority, not some, not a portion, not half, but all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. So now since I have all authority, I want all custody. This is so good, y'all. I want all custody. I want to speak around this thought from this subject on this Resurrection Sunday morning. I want full custody. I want full custody. I deserve full custody. I earned full custody. I was crucified for full custody. I was buried for full custody. I suffered for full custody. I know that you might have come here to hear some cute, colorful rabbit hand you some eggs Easter sermon, but that is not what we came here to celebrate. We came to celebrate the lion went in the grave as a lamb, but he came out as a resurrected lion, as the victorious king, as our conquering savior. I didn't come to play with you this afternoon. Jesus said, I need you to tell my people the resurrection is not just a celebration, it's a declaration. And what is that declaration? I have all authority and I want full custody. Father, in this moment, we thank you for getting up. For if you would not have defeated death, all of this will be futile, none and void. But the same spirit that raised you from the grave also lives on the inside of those who have confessed you as Lord. And just like I prayed to you in private, I also declare it publicly. Let this be a piercing word. A word that will cause casual Christians to recognize you don't want custody on weekends. You want custody 24-7. Help us to recognize the resurrection is not something we celebrate on a day, but we are constantly walking around with a celebratory heart. Anoint my lips to be the PA system, the soundtrack of heaven. We're asking that you do it in Jesus' name. And everybody who agrees with that prayer, would you shout in the room, amen. amen. All authority. Not some, but all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, just in case you were and are unaware of it, I want you to know that there was a spiritual custody battle going on. That there was a spiritual custody battle going on between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Now, the enemy, Lucifer, that old serpent, he strives to get us to engage in sin. He wants sin to have full custody over your mind. And sin to have full custody over your thought patterns. And sin to have full custody over your mental sobriety. But Jesus says, hold up, wait a minute. I defeated death so you no longer have full custody. <laughs> Look at this church family. I have been given all authority. You know what that means? I have the authority to reverse assassination attempts. Can I brag on my God just for a second? I want to show you how awesome God is. I have the authority to reverse assassination attempts. Adam and Eve got in trouble due to eating something that was hanging on a tree. But Jesus specializes in reversing assassination attempts. We got out of trouble due to him hanging on a tree. Because I specialize in reversing what the enemy is trying to fulfill. I'm going to keep going. We all got in trouble. We all got in trouble because Adam represented all of us. And they were in paradise. But due to sin, they got kicked out. Somebody say out. Jesus is outside of the city. Dying on the cross to get us to experience paradise once again because he specializes in reversing assassination attempts. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Jesus was obedient in the garden. 
when Adam and Eve were disobedient in the garden. Y'all catching this? Because I specialize in reversing assassination attempts. Let's make it personal. You and I have made detrimental and deadly decisions that should have brought death to our path. But Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, watch this, life put death to death. Come on, Holy Spirit. Life put death to death. You don't have the legal rights anymore, sin and death. I defeated you. So I want full custody over their mind. And I want full custody over their thought process. And I want full custody over their mental sobriety. So that I could fulfill Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Where the text tells us, let this mind be in you. I love when the word compliments itself. Let this mind be in you. That was also in Christ Jesus. I want full custody. I, I desire full custody. I long for full custody. No longer will my children need marijuana, need weed. We talking about it on Resurrection Sunday. No longer will they need an alcoholic beverage. Will they need orgasms from people that they're not married to? No longer will they need narcotics needles or any pill to try to give them peace I declare that I'm the prince of peace and I have full custody I declare that I'm the one that will give my beloved sweet sleep you don't need to masturbate and have a vibrator to get you some sweet to get you some sweet sleep I'm better than melatonin I give my beloved sweet sleep I declare that my children, anybody who's tired, all who are weary and heavy laden, if they come to me, I will give rest to their soul. This will be the year of mental soundness. This will be the year of mental peace. This will be the year I declutter their thought life. This will be the year their mind will no longer be on a merry-go-round of negativity and what if and negative thoughts. But I will brand Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 on the fraternity of their meditations. My children will think on things above. Y'all better come get me. And not on things beneath. I want full custody. All authority has been given to me. Sin wants to have custody over your anatomy. But Jesus says, okay, remember, I defeated sin and death. So those who are called by my name, uh uh-oh, those who claim to be Christians, no longer will we yield the members of our body to be instruments of wickedness. Members are your body parts. No longer will I use any part of my body as an instrument that can yield towards wickedness. But my children, their body, it was made to house the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's gonna get uncomfortable. Your body was not made for fornication. The body was not made for adultery. It was not made for same-sex sin. It was not made for abortion. It was not made to pass the Cavassier Hennessy or sip on gin and juice. But it was made to house the Holy Spirit. It was made to house the kingdom. It was made to be God's transportation system throughout the earth. All authority has been given to me and I want custody. This is what God has anointed for me to preach to you on this afternoon. I know we can celebrate the resurrection, but I want them to remember this means I want full custody. Not just weekend visits. Somebody caught it. Not just weekend visits. Not just Wednesday for discipleship. Not just Sunday at 10 or 12. I don't want weekend visits. I want full custody. Can we go a little deeper? See, we have to understand the power of the resurrection is that we no longer need to bring the blood of bulls and goats. We no longer need a high priest to go before us on our behalf. I want us to understand this. 
the tabernacle of God or the tabernacle of Moses really had three sections. It was the outer court, the most holy place, and the holies of holies. Okay? Now, the outer court, anybody could come here on the outer court. But the holies of holies had a veil right there. And the only person that could go toward and in that veil was the high priest once a year on the day of atonement. You and I couldn't just walk in there because you would die. The tabernacle of God was symbolic of God's earthly presence. Okay? So the veil, you got to understand, veil has great significance. Many of us think that the veil that you wear on a wedding, that's just some tradition that you have. No, this stuff stems from the Bible. We see the veil in the tabernacle of God. We see Moses had a veil on his face after he was in the presence of God. I did a wedding just two weeks ago, and did you know when the woman wears the veil, the only person who can lift it is the husband. Y'all missed what I just said. Y'all missed what I just said. Even though I'm standing as a pastor or a priest, I don't have the authority to lift her veil. The only person who had the authority to remove the veil was her husband. He removes the veil, meaning now I have access to all of this. I'm going to protect all of this. She lets him remove the veil, which means I trust for you to be my provider. I trust for you to be my lover. I trust for you to be my keeper. I trust for you to be my protector. So when Jesus died, scripture says the veil of the temple was torn. Jesus lifted the veil where now every tongue, every nationality, Jew, Greek, black, white, Latino, Puerto Rican, it doesn't matter. Everybody has access to the holies of holies because of what Jesus did. You don't have to go to a priest anymore. Wherever you are, you can get right down on your knees and say, Father, forgive me for my sins. And you got full access. That's something to celebrate, not a bunny rabbit. You have full access. The veil was torn from top to bottom. This was a thick drape. It wasn't a sheet of paper. No man ripped this. This was a divine event designed to show us access has been granted. And since access has been granted, I want full custody. I've come so that you might have life and have life more abundantly. Now here is where the sermon takes a tire screeching U-turn. It's going to come for your edges for the next 19 minutes. You don't get the abundantly without giving Jesus the custody. Many of us are praying for the abundantly, but Jesus is like, I don't have full custody. In your life where you want abundantly, Jesus wants you to know, do I have custody? Because I'm not a side chick. I don't come as a friend with benefits. I'm coming into your life as a king, not a president. Nobody can impeach me or voted me in. I want full custody. Hmm. Therefore, I begin to think, how do we give Jesus full custody? We give him our commitment. We, we give him our commitment. In fact, commitment is required if you want him to have full custody. Okay? See, it's going to get real quiet, Steve, for the next few moments. All right? So Jesus is saying, I want your commitment, not just your honorable mention. I want your commitment. So when it seems daunting, I still want your commitment. Because commitment is your signature on a custody agreement. When it seems frightening, I still want your commitment because commitment is your signature on a custody agreement. When it seems as though your will will be better than my plan, 
I still want your commitment because commitment is the signature of a custody agreement. When you feel as though my ways are inconveniencing you, I think I need to park right there. Park right there because we've been in a trap house series for seven weeks. And a trap that many of us have missed, a trap that is often overlooked because remember, the power and the effectiveness of a trap is for it to camouflage. It's not a good trap if you could see it. What makes a trap effectiveness is its ability to blend. So what's the trap that the enemy has been using that many of us overlook? I'm glad you asked. It's the trap of convenience. Because you're only committed until it's inconvenient. As long as it's convenient, I'm committed. But once it becomes inconvenient, I'm out. <laughs> I told you, you're not going to like it. I know. You cannot be sold out and cohabitate with convenience at the same time. I want your commitment. You cannot faithfully serve if your service is married to how convenient it will be. I want your commitment. You cannot love at all times. That's what scripture tells us to do, right? We can't love at all times if our love is based on the condition if it's convenient or inconvenient. Married people, I'm going to come for you. Um, the reason many of our marriages are a life support is because one or both parties resist being inconvenienced. I know, getting quiet, right? <laughs> marriages on life support, I don't want to crush my pride. That's inconvenient. I don't want to hold my tongue. That's inconvenient. I don't want to use a kind word that turns away wrath. That's inconvenient. I don't want to cook on tonight. That's inconvenient. I don't want to have sex on tonight. That's inconvenient. I don't want to do the dishes or help with the children. That's a woman's job. I, that's inconvenient for me. Most relational problems fall around this particular word, the unwillingness to be inconvenienced. Yeah, you don't understand how uncomfortable it is. Like, God got to help a brother. You don't understand how inconvenient it is. I bet Jesus is like, um, hello. <laughs> this was very inconvenient. This was very uncomfortable for me to push up for three hours with nails in my hand and nails in my feet just to breathe. You don't think I understand? I know what it's like when you don't want to do God's will because it will be inconvenient. I modeled this to you. I prayed so hard to where I experienced a medical condition titled, entitled hermitidrosis. It's when you are under so much stress and so much agony that you begin to sweat blood. Soldiers have experienced it. About to go into battle under anguish in line, knowing you're about to go to war, sweating blood. There was a child who drowned in an apartment complex. And when EMT found the boy, there was blood streaming down his face. Apparently, under the water as he was drowning and suffocating, he was screaming so much so to where he experienced hermitidrosis. I want you to see this. Luke, Luke chapter 22, verse 44. I'm not preaching my opinion. Luke chapter 22, verse 44. It says, and being in agony... He prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. See, the revelation that God gave me on this was so profound. When Jesus was praying, Father, if it be possible, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Blood. Father, if it be possible, take this cup away from me. Father, if it be possible, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Sweating blood. God was actually answering Jesus' prayer in his face. My will is for you to shed your blood. That's my will. And how committed will you be when your will will be inconvenienced for his? Because... Commitment is the signature 
on a custody agreement. The trap that many of us are falling into is the trap of convenience. God bought us, God bought us with Christ at no charge, but he still wants change back. Bars. Did y'all hear what I just said? God bought us with Christ at no charge, but he still wants change back. I want somebody just got it. Oh, I just got it. <laughs> I want full custody. See, the, the reason I wanted us to have this, like I hope you have a pen. Hope you have a pen where you can sign this like right now. I'll wait. Find somebody next to you. Get a pen and you can sign it. Because this, this right here is a certificate of custody. Okay, I want you to take it, have it in your office, have it in your bedroom. Before you respond to that DM, look at this. <laughs> Before you drink that alcohol, how about put this on your fridge? Wherever you need to put it, put it over your bed. So the next time he comes over, before y'all do something, he can say, what is that? <laughs> Wherever you need to put it to help you remember that the resurrection is not just a celebration. It's a declaration. And that declaration is, I want full custody. So this certificate of kingdom ownership and custody, this certificate is proudly presented to, and you can put your name there. See, watch this, watch this. I don't want you to miss this. Okay. Remember, commitment is the signature of a custody agreement. All right? Therefore, the biblical word for commitment is faithfulness. Faithfulness. Commitment is a trait that God has that he wants all of us to plagiarize. Can I mess your theology up some more? Thank you, name. Thank you. Our commitment to God is not for God. Your commitment to God is really for you. Okay. This certificate of custody, when you allow me to have custody, you become saved, you become justified, redeemed, an ambassador, chosen, adopted, forgiven, made alive, sealed, set free, set apart. That sounds like that's for us, not for God. Okay? And the way he signed it is in red, the cross. This is so powerful, y'all. Understand, you don't pray for God. Your prayers don't make him any more holy. You pray for you. You don't come to worship for God. You come so that you can be surrounded by believers and that you could grow in your faith. See, a lot of us, we have allowed this entitled culture to cause us to be entitled Christians. I'm like, you know you're not doing this for God, right? You're doing this for you. You being under God's custody makes your life better. Is this making sense? Someone says, okay, I, I want full custody. Everything you have, I want custody of it. Your choices, I want custody over that. Your body, I want custody over that too. Your wealth, uh-oh, coming for your wallet. I want custody over that too. I think you must have forgot that you're stewarding what I gave you. My car, that's not yours. Everything that you have, I'm just allowing you to steward it. So why are you feeling some type of way when I'm asking back what's mine? See, it's not yours in the first place. It's mine. How much more generous would you be if you viewed everything you had as loan to you? And it's your job just to steward it. Your children, steward them. You steward it. 
want you to sign this so that you'll never forget. On Resurrection Sunday, I didn't come hear a message about an Easter bunny made me laugh and give me jokes. I heard a message where Jesus is saying, remind my people I got full custody. They're praying to me about abundantly, but I want them to know they don't get that without custody. So I, I want to give you some points, and I'm going to get out your way. Before I give you points, I want you to understand this. Okay, please hear me. You can have more degrees than a thermostat. You can, you can have accolades. God doesn't go off of degrees. He goes off of committed hearts. Faithfulness. How did you get that? What school did you go to? Jerry, where did you go to seminary? How did you do this? How did you? All I know is I've been faithful. That's it. When no lights, nobody was watching, vacuum and changes, all I know is I've been faithful. And I don't deserve it. I'm just thankful that he saved me. Everything else that happens is great. But I'm just thankful that he has me under his custody. That's the biggest blessing to me. You cannot earn God's favor. Watch this. But you can position yourself to receive it. It's nothing you can earn, but you can position yourself to receive it if you allow him to have full custody. So I want us to understand how this works. Point number one, the enemy doesn't hit what he wants. Please hear me. This is powerful. The enemy doesn't hit what he wants. Watch me. He hits what's primary to you, but secondary to him. Your money is primary to you. It's secondary to him. So I'm going to hit what's primary to you because what's primary to me is your commitment. And I want to see, does money have your commitment? So I'm going to hit that to see if I can take this. I want your commitment. I hit your marriage. I don't want your spouse. I can barely stand them either. I don't want them. But I want you to experience so much trauma, so much pain that that causes for you to question your commitment with God. And now I could take your commitment because I hid it what was primary to you. But that was secondary to me. What I really want is your commitment because I know, I know that your commitment causes for you to get the custody. I know that your commitment causes for you to experience the abundantly. I know that your commitment causes for you to experience grace. I know that your commitment causes for you to experience mercy. What I want is your commitment, not your stuff. I don't want your car. I can't drive it. But maybe your car is primary. Your transportation, I got to get there. You know, I got to. Let me hit what's primary to them, but it's really secondary to me. But watch this, church. If your commitment is your primary, it doesn't matter what the enemy hits. My commitment can get all that back. Please hear me. The devil never hits what he wants. What's primary to you is secondary to him. Point number two, commitment takes a relationship from surface to depth. I'm talking about spiritual. It can work natural too. Any time I'm in a relational context and I'm taking more withdrawals than deposits, I am not a partner, I am a parasite. Yeah. Hear me, hear me. You cannot have a relationship without reciprocity. You cannot. You're so good, I want to be good back to you. You're so awesome, I, I want to try to do something that is awesome that can give you glory. Because you cannot have a relationship without reciprocity. If you have that, that is not a partner, that is a leech. And a lot of us, ooh, a lot of us are engaged in leech Christianity. I just want the blood of Jesus, but not the custody. I thought it was going to be a cute resurrection message. You know I don't do that. Am I engaged in leech Christianity? I just want his blood. <laughs> but I don't want the custody. It's possible that the quality of your current season 
is directly in proportion to your commitment in former seasons. And that could be good or bad. How my current season looks is tied to my commitment of former seasons. That could be good or bad. Even if this season is hellish, my commitment won't fold. So this season won't last. There's a scripture that most of us, we take out of context. I want to show, this, show us this. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. It says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap a harvest if we faint not. I read that and I saw something brand new for the first time. We usually preach due season as though it's a timing thing. That's not totally incorrect, but it is incomplete. Due season is not just a timing thing. It's also, also an attribute thing. Do you have commitment that won't faint? Y'all missed it. You reap a harvest if you don't faint. It's not just about the timing. It's also about your commitment that doesn't quit. James chapter 4 verse 8. Come close to God. And God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. I've said this so many times, y'all. People don't abandon things they want. They abandon things they were using. Loyalty is always revealed in the face of options. For everybody who says, I'm committed, you haven't had the right options yet. When you get options that seem better than the custody, will you still serve Jesus or not? Because many of us are opportunist Christians. I will be committed as long as it's an opportunity. I experienced this heavily in 2019 and 2020. I recognize a lot of people that I would call them brothers and friends were just opportunists. When COVID happened and they had no opportunity, they out. (laughs) Some people join our church just for an opportunity. Maybe if I connect with them, my ministry will. And when you recognize it's not beneficial for your opportunity, I'm out. You will always be out of tune with the orchestra of the faithful if the only tune you live for is opportunities. (laughs) Number three, nothing becomes without commitment. That's your health, your diet, your marriage nor your spirituality. Nothing becomes. So we become people who want support but don't want to support. Want spotlight but don't want to serve in shadows. Want bigger checks but don't want to give. How would it benefit the kingdom for God to give you more? Last point. This all brings it together. The area that I surrender is my head, my heart, my hands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Your hands, your strength. Head, heart, hands. I want you to see this chart, and I'm done. I need your head, your thoughts. This is all connected, family. Because if you have committed hands, but you don't have a committed heart, When the hands become inconvenient, your heart is out. It's all connected. If you have a committed head, meaning you know the word of God, but you don't have a committed heart, it'll make you a Pharisee. So you'll know the word, but lack love. I need all of them. I need custody over every facet of your life. Because if you want the abundantly, got to have the custody and I came today because I want you to have something to take home with you not an egg not a bag filled with chocolate take this home and allow this to be a reminder that yes he did get up but he got up because I want custody What are you asking God to give you abundant of? And he's saying, I want ownership of. He's so good. I deserve your custody. And your life will be so much better if you sign this with your commitment. Not your honorable mention, 
Sign it with your commitment. Because commitment is the signature on a custody agreement. Father, we repent. While many may be having barbecue and going out to eat, excited that they had Friday and possibly even Monday off, allow us to remember that Good Friday never feels good while it's Friday. And we're so thankful, Lord, that you defeated death. But that's just the beginning. You said it is finished, not you are finished. The work now begins for us for the rest of our lives to give you full custody. Forgive us for trying to own the wheel. Every single time we end up in a place where we feel our life is sinking. If we look close enough, we'll see it's because we're in the driver's seat. Help us to get out of your spot. And on this day, maybe for somebody, they'll be able to say it was this Resurrection Sunday where I gave Jesus full custody. In Jesus' name, we're asking that you do it. Amen. Amen. Were you blessed on today?